That was a terrific first, first panel. I want to thank Jim Burns uh, for moderating it and all the panelists. Uh, great perspective to open up the conference. Uh, we're now on to our second panel. Uh, it's entitled Assessing the Market Impact of the Rules. And we have uh, two very distinguished uh, speakers today. One uh, is S.P. Kotari. He is the current uh, Chief Economist of the Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, he arrived at the SEC uh, a little, almost a year ago uh, now. He is a professor of accounting and finance at the MIT School of Management. Uh, he's done many interesting things in his career. Uh, he's been journal, he's been journal editor of one of the top accounting journals in the profession. Um, he was also a senior administrator at MIT uh, as a deputy dean for several years. Um, and he also headed up Barclays Global Investors for a number of years, we led a team of about 50 economists uh, developing uh, investment strategies. So it is safe to say, and also I should know that his, he's, a, he's a PhD accountant and not a PhD uh, a finance or economist. Uh, so it makes him truly unique in terms of uh, the training for uh, a chief economist position at the SEC. But it's true that um, uh, he's very unique in, in many dimensions. Um, and having experience working in industry and academia, uh, I think he's perfectly well suited uh, to lead the agency. So. Um, I'm going to welcome him in just a second, but also want to mention that we have Chester Spat with us. He is a former chief economist uh, of the SEC. He's a professor at uh, Carnegie Mellon University. Um, and between the two of them, they spanned my entire time at the SEC. Chester hired me. Uh, and I don't want to say uh, SP fired me, uh, but I left uh, right before he arrived. <laughs> uh, so with that, uh, SP is going to come up and give some remarks. I want to welcome you to the lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Uh, really appreciate the kind introduction. Uh, I didn't fire anybody. And <clears throat> I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to speak at this conference on regulation best interest. And before I begin my remarks, uh, I need to mention that the views that I express today are my own and do not necessarily reflect the views of the commission or its staff. The irony is that in spite of this disclaimer, I had to get all these remarks okayed by the GC, the general counsel. So that, that's how the, it works. And it's customary to include uh, a joke in, in, in these kinds of opening remarks or, or in the prepared remarks and of course, the general counsel dutifully took out those, that joke, and you know, maybe it wasn't funny enough, but <clears throat> then, of course, the document went to Woodrow Johnson. Uh, he, he has been helping me with preparing these remarks, and Woodrow Johnson, of course, sent those the edited comments to two research associates who have been helping him and the research associates, of course, dutifully sent it to a couple of interns who have been helping those research associates. And then the edited comments went back from the interns to the research associates to Woodrow Johnson and then to me. Needless to say, these are well-traveled comments, so uh, let, me, let me begin with the substance of it. Uh, so I will talk, begin the talk with uh, the principal agent problem. So this is about the economic analysis of, of Reg BI. Uh, and at the heart of <clears throat> that is the principal agent problem. And that's in economics, as most of you know, it's a contract design problem that has come to be known as principal agent problem. And this problem frequently arises when, for example, one person, the principal, hires another person, the agent, to act on the principal's behalf. Uh, <clears throat> if the principal does not see all actions taken by the agent, or if the principal does not have access to all information of the agent, the agent might take actions that benefit the agent at the expense of the principal. So that's, that's the basic principal agent problem. And a broad range of economic relationships fit into the principal agent framework, 
beyond the owner-agent problem that I just mentioned. Let me list a few of them. The relationship between an insurance company and the insured. The insurance company cannot generally observe how much care is taken by the insured. In the relationship between a manufacturer and its distributors, the manufacturer may not be able to observe the market conditions faced by the distributors. In the relationship between a bank and its borrower, the bank might not be able to observe whether the loan, loan funds were used as promised. In the relationship between a physician and the patient, the patient might not understand the physician's incentives to recommend a particular treatment. In the relationship between a broker-dealer, issue of interest over here, in the relationship between a broker-dealer and its retail customer, the retail customer might not understand the broker-dealer's incentives to recommend a particular investment. And it is in this context that regulation best interests came about. When economists first start thinking about the need for a rule, they seek to identify the underlying economic problem that the rule is trying to address. In the case of regulation best interest, or Reg BI, agency costs are at the root of existing allocative inefficiencies in the market for broker-dealer advice. Retail customers face agency problems when they seek advice from financial professionals. For example, a retail customer may believe that a broker-dealer will exert a high level of effort on a retail customer's behalf to identify a security that helps the retail customer meet her objectives. But to the extent that effort is costly to the broker-dealer, and the benefits of the recommendation accrue solely to the retail customer, the broker-dealer has an incentive to exert a lower level of effort than the retail customer expects. This is, again, a classic principal agent problem. Additionally, the Commission has previously expressed long-held concerns about the incentives that commission-based compensation provides to churn accounts. Churning occurs when a broker-dealer exercising control over the volume and frequency of trading in a customer account abuses the customer's confidence for the broker-dealer's personal gain by initiating transactions that are excessive in view of the character of the account and the customer's investment objectives. Reg BI is designed to address certain agency costs that arise in the relationship between a broker-dealer and its retail customer. The essential idea is succinctly captured in the following quote from the rule text. A broker, when making a recommendation to a retail customer, shall act in the best interest of the retail customer at the time the recommendation is made without placing the financial or other interest of the broker ahead of the interest of the retail customer. The best interest obligation is satisfied when four component obligations are met. And the, the four component obligations are the disclosure obligation, the care obligation, the conflict of interest obligation, and the compliance obligation. What are these? So let me briefly tell you about these four obligations. The disclosure obligation entails providing certain prescribed disclosures before or at the time of recommendation about the recommendation and the relationship between the retail customer and the broker dealer. The care obligation entails exercising reasonable diligence, care, and skill in making the recommendation. The conflict of interest obligation entails establishing, maintaining, and enforcing policies and procedures reasonably designed to address conflicts of interest. The compliance obligation 
entails establishing, maintaining, and enforcing policies and procedures reasonably designed to achieve compliance with regulation best interest. The Commission crafted Reg BI to draw on key principles underlying fiduciary obligations, including those that apply to investment advisors under the Advisors Act, while providing specific requirements to address certain aspects of the relationship between broker-dealers and their retail customers. Reg BI enhances the existing standard of conduct, ap conduct applicable to broker-dealers at the time they recommend to a retail customer a securities transaction or investment strategy involving securities. The new standard is intended to enhance investor protection while preserving to the extent possible retail investor access in terms of both choice and cost to differing types of investment services and securities. This choice element is what was repeatedly underscored in the conversation that we had the privilege of listening to uh, in the preceding session. Now let me talk a little bit about the economic analysis that uh, my division conducted. Uh, even though, as Scott said, you know, I joined in March of 2019, so just a little less than a year ago. So much of the economic analysis I inherited and then I had some input to it, but a fair bit of it was baked in. Uh, having identified the economic problem that Reg BI addresses, let me turn to how the release analyzed the potential economic effects of the rule. I will summarize the following portions of the release. One, establishing an economic baseline, assessing the rule's potential economic effects relative to that baseline, and evaluating potential alternatives to the rule. So what was the baseline? The economic analysis began with a study of the way things were before the Commission considered any rule changes. In particular, the baseline discusses the current state of the broker-dealer and investment advisor market, the current regulatory environment and market practices surrounding the provision of recommendations by broker-dealers, evidence on the potential value, value to and harm from investment advice, and how issues related to trust, fiducial, uh, I'm sorry, financial literacy, and disclosure effectiveness affect conflicts of, between in, investors and financial professionals. The baseline analysis looked at the current providers of financial services, focusing on broker-dealers, SEC registered investment advisors, and firms that are both broker-dealers and SEC registered investment advisors. So these are the duly registered, registered advisors namely dual registrants. As of December 2018, there were nearly 13,300 SEC registered investment advisors. About 270 of these firms had over $50 billion in assets under management, and this 2% of the registered investment advisors manage 70% of client assets. At the same time, there were nearly 3,800 broker-dealers. 17 of these firms had over $50 billion in firm assets, and they held just over two-thirds of client assets. 10 dual registrants had over $50 billion in firm assets. In other words, half, over half of the largest 17 broker-dealers were dual registrants. The release analyzed the regulatory environments prior to the adoption of Reg BI and current market practices of broker-dealers. Thus, the baseline included federal and state law and regulation, as well as the rules and guidance of self-regulatory organizations, SROs. Whereas broker-dealers have explicit requirements to establish written policies and procedures 
reasonably designed to disclose, mitigate, or eliminate identified conflicts of interest that create an incentive to place their interest ahead of the retail customer, the fiduciary standard for investment advisors relies on full and fair disclosure and informed consent to address conflicts of interest. Personally, I like to think of the broker-dealer standard as being relatively more rules-based and the investment advisor standard as being relatively more principles-based. The release also examined the Department of Labor's 2016 fiduciary rule, which was vacated in 2018 because certain broker-dealers and other industry participants may have adjusted their practices in order to plan for the implementation of this rule. The next element of the economic analysis was to assess benefits and costs of the proposed rule. In the section of the economic analysis, the commission analyzed the potential economic ben effects of the regulation. In doing so, the release undertook an analysis of each of the four component obligations. And to recall, those were disclosure, care, conflict of interest, and compliance. I will now highlight some of the analysis of the care obligation, both the benefits and the costs. Under the baseline, broker-dealers are subject to suitability obligations and requirements when making recommendations to retail customers. The care obligation incorporates and adds to these existing suitability requirements. First, broker-dealers are now explicitly required to consider the cost of a recommendation. This should reduce the incidence of recommendations of higher cost investments from a set of reasonably available alternatives that achieve the retail customer's objective. This change may affect, for example, the mutual fund share class that a broker-dealer recommends. Second, Broker-dealers are prohibited from recommending any series of transactions unless they have a reasonable basis to believe that the transactions are in the retail customer's best interest. This change relative to the baseline should enhance investor protection by reducing the incidence of cases where a broker-dealer recommends an excessively high rate of portfolio turnover or churn. Third, Reg BI applies to account recommendations. Even those that do not believe a securities transaction, which is not necessarily the case under FINRA's suitability standard. For example, this should result in IRA and IRA rollover recommendations to retail customers that are more efficient because they will be in the retail customer's best interest, regardless of whether or not they involve securities transaction. Several rec commenters highlighted the heightened risk of harm associated with IRA and IRA rollover recommendations because the amount of assets associated with such recommendations can be a significant portion of a retail customer's net worth. This change may affect, for example, the recommendations a broker-dealer makes about a retail customer's 401k plan upon retirement. A fourth benefit stems from any agreed upon account monitoring services. Specifically, the care obligation will apply at the point in time at which the broker-dealer performs the agreed upon monitoring, regardless of whether the broker-dealer communicates any recommendation. This change may affect, for example, the level of effort the broker-dealer makes when reviewing the retail customer's portfolio. Let me now list four costs of the care obligation that are discussed in the adopting release. Some customer dealers may stop offering certain securities to all retail customers, even if they have a reasonable basis to believe that those securities could be in the best interest of some retail customers. Because the care obligation holds broker-dealers to an enhanced standard of conduct, 
They may incur costs associated with increased legal exposure if, for example, Reg BI results in increased retail customer arbitrations or litigation. The care obligation explicitly requires that costs be considered as a factor when determining whether a recommendation is in the best interest of a retail customer. Several commenters stated that the proposing releases guidance emphasizing cost as a specific factor in the care obligation could create uncertainty around how the cost of a recommendation should be weighed with other factors. Broker dealers may decide to cease offering monitoring services to retail customers. The economic analysis also considers reasonable alternatives. Okay. And the commission considered several reasonable alternatives when writing Reg BI, and the economic analysis examined those alternatives. The longest part of that analysis examined the fiduciary standard alternative, that is the Department of Labor uh, alternative. Under any of the fiduciary standard options considered, the commission would have to craft a mechanism to apply a uniform stand of, standard of conduct to all financial professionals, regardless of how they engage with their retail customers. One of the benefits of this approach is that it could reduce retail customers' confusion, something that was discussed in the previous panel. Uh, it would reduce retail customers' confusion with respect to the duties owed to them by the broker dealers and investment advisors and could reduce potential cost to some investors associated with choosing a type of relationship that is not well suited to them because under a uniform standard, retail customers of each type of financial professional would be subject to the same standard of conduct. Okay. However, this uniformity could come at a cost to both investors and financial service providers. Potentially higher compliance costs could increase the incentive to offer investment advice in the capacity of investment advisor and could decrease the investment, uh, um, could decrease the incentive to offer investment advice in the capacity of broker dealer. The potential exit of broker dealers from the market for investment advice in the broker dealer capacity would limit how retail customers would access certain securities or investment strategies and how they would pay for investment advice, which in turn could in increase their cost of obtaining investment advice relative to the baseline. The commission an analyzed three different fiduciary standard ad alternatives. The, fidu the fiduciary standard for investment advisors under the Advisors Act of 1940 the fiduciary standard recommended by staff in the 2011 SEC staff reported study on investment advisors and broker dealers, and the fiduciary standard under the Department of Labor's fiduciary rule. The details of that analysis <clears throat> are beyond the scope of today's discussion, unless you want to listen to me for another couple hours. Right. So in conclusion, okay, although I have covered a lot of ground in my short introduction to Reg BI's economic analysis, I really only scratched the surface. I encourage those interested in economics to read the economic analysis. I expect that you too will conclude that the analysis is thoughtful, comprehensive, and robust. Thank you. It's a great pleasure uh, to, to be great pleasure to be here uh, today. Let me thank Scott uh, for the for the very kind invitation to speak. Um, you know, of course, I have I have not since since I stepped down as the SEC's uh, chief economist um, more than uh, more than 12 years ago. Um, I haven't needed to provide a disclaimer, but I should perhaps provide a disclaimer at the start. Not about the SEC. It'll be obvious that my views 
are at least somewhat different th than the commissions, but um, because there's been so much attention uh, devoted to a letter uh, that I signed with a uh, with a bunch of my former uh, uh, with, with a bunch of the of other former uh, chief economists, I should say that what I'm going to say reflects my own views, uh, but not necessarily the views of the other former chief economists. Um, and that'll maybe be obvious also at the start of my, my remarks, because initially I'm not going to talk at all about regulation BI, but I am going to talk about best interest. In particular, what I want to do is I want to frame the issue of what, for, what serves the investor's best interest and provide an economist's perspective on that, and in particular, you know, a perspective uh, in, informed by some of my academic expertise, expertise both about investing, about portfolio theory, uh, and, uh, and about uh, age, age theory. And I think agency theory is perhaps a good place to be. I'll begin with just some brief comments about agency theory in the spirit, of SP, uh, in the spirit also of SP's uh, introduction as well. Uh, um, so I think a, a central aspect, uh, uh, of course, here is the, um, is, is the delegation of decision making uh, uh, to, to agents of various types. It could be a broker, it could be advisor, it could be other experts. Um, but at the same time, the inherent relationship between the principal and the agent creates at least the potential for misalignment in those incentives. There could be alignment, there could be misalignment. Uh, and what agency theory tries to do, uh, at least as economists uh, uh, try to implement it, it focuses uh, upon what are the sources of misalignment and alignment, and how can we perhaps obtain uh, better alignment. At the core of this is compensation. Uh, uh, how do, what is the role of compensation, and how does that play into things? Um, what are the, some of the distinctions in preferences, particularly with respect to agent effort and risk taking? Uh, but of course, and, and you might wonder, well, if there's potential misalignment, why do we have agents? Well, of course, we have agents because they bring, at least potentially, superior knowledge and expertise. In many cases, and certainly in the investing context, much of the public may have relatively limited expertise and is relying uh, on, on professionals. Now, what are the, the types of solution techniques and uh, 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 ways that we, res we can resolve these issues? Well, in part, uh, there are various contractual tools and remedies. Uh, I think in terms of the traditional academic models, compensation plays a huge, the structure of compensation is at the core uh, of how we mitigate uh, incentive conflicts. But it's also important to keep in mind that compensation uh, and in particular, certain compensation practices can actually amplify the incentive conflict. Uh, for example, rewarding um, brokers or advisors for selling certain products rather than other products can create, can create uh, is an example potentially where distortions can arise because of the compensation. So while compensation can be a tool to resolve the, the incentive conflict, it can also go the other way and compensation depending upon how it's structured, can amplify uh, the incentive conflict. Uh, I, I think of uh, a key broad aspect of agency theory as suggesting that imposing risk on the agent is potentially very important to achieve greater incentive alignment and cr to create incentives. Of course, one can't impose all the risk on the agent because of his inherent risk aversion, but imposing risk seems to me uh, an important feature. And finally, uh, you know, in this context, I think it's also important to highlight that regulation can potentially at least remedy um, market failures. Now, I, I should note that as we traditionally think about the agency problem, it basically involves maximizing um, an objective for the principal subject to the agent earning a competitive return and subject to um, the agent following his incentive constraints. So that's basically just some broad uh, framing that I, that I thought would be helpful to provide um, about uh, the underlying um, uh, conflict. Uh, um, now, what do I, you know, as I step back as a, as a financial theorist and think about what do I view as the intrinsic issues that should be of interest to the investor, it seems to me what's really important is um, the investor making his decisions about risk allocation, so overall asset allocation. But I think more than that, um, 
I think also where you, al where you allocate those risks in the different investment buckets you have. And in this context, what I would point to is the issue of asset location, uh, of which by coincidence I happen to be a, a leading expert. My, my paper with Bob Damon and Harold Zhang in the Journal of Finance um, is I think generally viewed as perhaps the key paper on what it, how do you allocate within your taxable bucket and how do you allocate within your tax, de tax deferred bucket simultaneously. In effect, how do you get from a post-tax efficiency perspective, how do you get the most out of the, the, the differing tax treatment? The so one issue, broadly, is risk allocation. Um, um, another issue is the choice of products, um, mutual funds, ETFs, individual names, and which specific ones. Uh, and then there are issues about trading tactics. Specifics of trade execution, order routing, you know, in this day and age, issues involving rebates and fees, um, realization of tax losses, these sort of involve the details uh, of trading tactics. These seem to me to be the broad, high-level investment decisions, and what investors should, would like to do, or should like to do, is to, uh, within the context of the various constraints, try to operate efficiently and effectively, but also taking into account the costs of the professionals, uh, including the professionals' opportunity costs of making, of, of making good decisions. So sometimes, frankly, it's not, it, it wouldn't be, it's not necessarily worth the cost, even though there might be additional benefits. Uh, for example, on the issue of investing in individual names, so who should invest in individual names? Obviously, we've had a big move in our society toward investing in ETFs uh, and mutual funds. Well, let me point to a couple of examples where I think investing in individual names makes sense. So for investors who are truly informed, who have sophisticated information, uh, um, it may make sense to invest in individual names. Um, now, you know, our, our financial theories emphasize also um, that one should be cautious in just thinking that they necessarily have superior information um, um, because, because of the, the information that others have and, um, uh, and the nature of just adverse selection in trading in markets. There may be some investors who have superior access, perhaps in unusual circumstances, opportunities to buy in at discounts, whether through compensation programs or, or otherwise. Uh, again, investing in individual names may make sense. Systematic, uh, systematically exploiting tax opportunities. Again, it might make sense to invest in individual names because of greater tax optionality and diversity in treatment. And indeed, individual names often appear to be the bread and butter of many brokers and advisors. Not, not all of them, but many of them are, are, are constantly recommending individual names. Yet in the academic community, certainly there's little evidence of either superior skill um, or systematic exploitation of superior skill on the one hand in, in security selection, or on the other, of systematic exploitation of gains and losses. Um, and, and then it raised questions about whether, whether enough value added is being provided relative to cost. Um, because there are alternatives. What are among the alternatives? Holding low, low expense passive vehicles. Um, you know, one of the prominent mutual fund organizations is currently offering products at three, base, at three basis points, um, for example. Um, some fund organizations that compete have, have sometimes gone down even, even to zero. Um, now, if we think of the broad principle, so there's alternatives out there. And those alternatives are not necessarily so costly to access. Now, obviously, investors are going to have a range of sophistications. And some may need support um, and, and from intermediaries. Um, but I think there are interesting questions about then what is the direction of the advice that, that they're being provided by those intermediaries. And I, and I say this also recognizing the, the these intermediaries and advisors need to be compensated for their time. And that's, in fact, very, very important. And the educational and distribution role that's provided, I think, is very, very important. Um, diversification, of course, is important. And I, I actually don't tend to, th some people think of it in terms of fixed target weight portfolios. For example, the old 60-40 or 70-30 equity fixed income split. I tend to think of it a little differently. I tend to think of it more in terms of buy hold. And I think of it that way because as valuations change in the marketplace, that suggests that one or another asset category has become relatively more or less important. But that's a, maybe a little bit of an idiosyncratic perspective. Um, basket trading. Um, uh, I think is, it may be useful as opposed to trading individual names because that minimizes your trading costs. 
Um, in fact, well, there's even an idea in, in, in economic theory called the no-trade theorem, which suggests that you don't want to systematically trade um, um, in, in many situations, because in effect, you think of it as if you're already at an optimal allocation and you think you have superior information, who's going to be trading on the other side? Other people who, who think they have superior. Um, now, one possible source of, of gains could be, could be tax, could be tax efficient. So I want to compare then the implicit perspective that I laid out um, and, and suggest kind of an interesting question. So is it, is it worthwhile to, fo to focus on individual names um, given the costs of brokers and advisors? Well, it could be. I think it's also important to recognize that distribution and education are costly. So I do, and I do, I do think that brokers and advisors provide important services, but it's important to keep in mind the cost, and it's important that they keep in mind the cost as re relative to the benefits that they're providing their clients. So I think from this, from, from this lens, I think it's interesting to just introspect on what, on what do finance professors tend to do in their, in their personal holdings. Well, my sense is that, it, that for most, what they do is they tend to hold diversified portfolios, often in the form of funds and, and ETFs. They focus very much on low expenses. Perhaps the more sophisticated ones might use um, might focus a little bit on tax management, even issues of asset location, realizing losses, um, but not so much the, the types of uh, um, uh, high-cost services um, um, uh, you know, that, we often, that we often hear about. Uh, you know, now it's interesting to me that there's a real issue. Um, uh, the, and wh why, don't, why, don't, why don't broad seg I think over time, broad segments of the public have grown to appreciate this, and you see this in the extent of passive investing over, over time and the growth um, uh, of that. But perhaps because of some of the compensation practices, this is not maybe perhaps more widely shared. So obviously, there's alternative types of agents. And I, this will be sort of my transition to, B, to BI. Um, there's brokers versus advisors. They're compens they tend to be compensated in different ways. The brokers tend to be compensated on a transaction basis. Uh, the advisors tend to be compensated for gathering assets. Um, you know, there's issues about some of the details, whether in-house products are treated differently and the like. I'm going to sort of put that aside. So what are the potential distortions that can arise from the these, these duality of these models? Well, one thing that's idiosyncratic to the transaction model is the idea of churning, the idea of creating a series of transactions um, uh, to create fees. One thing that's nice about the advising transaction model, which is based upon assets per se, um, is it doesn't lead to that incentive problem. So I think that's a nice feature. On the other hand, could the customer be in the one model versus the other model? I think that can be an interesting kind of issue too. Um, the customer's preferences between the one model versus the other might be different um, than what his vice advisor recommends. And you know, one has I've heard, but I don't know of any specific examples that when the Labor Department was moving to the fiduciary standards, that some, some players in the industry were using that as an opportunity to try to move firms over to the agent model. And they were doing so because they felt they could extract, they could, they could earn larger fees under that model. Uh, I don't know if that was the case. Um, I mean, in principle, uh, I, I certainly agree and believe um, that um, I believe in economic diversity rather than one size fits all, that different individuals potentially would benefit from different, uh, from diff from different types uh, of, of alternatives. And I, you know, I, and I see the, um, uh, you know, and I see the issue of these, of these two models in part from that spirit. Uh, and I think, I think regulation BI emerges uh, in the vacuum after the Labor Department fiduciary uh, standard is, is overturned. Um, the BI, of course, says you don't place uh, agent interest ahead of the, the client. Um, in a sense, I think of this as almost the double negative, and it raises kind of the question, what, is it, what does this mean? You know, as a non-lawyer, in principle, when I hear about this sort of phrase that, that the, agent, is, that the uh, agent or advisor is supposed to act in the principal's best interest, that sounds to me awfully similar to a fiduciary standard. But experts in the area, of course, tell me that that's not the case, and that best interest is somewhere between a fiduciary standard and a suitability uh, 
uh, standard. You know, whether this addresses the centrality of compensation and compensation disclosure, I'll, I'll sort of put aside. Um, my, you know, and I put aside also the issue, must the agent consider a broad range of products or only house products to the extent that there's ambiguity about that? I sort of wonder whether this really is putting the agent's interest um, uh, uh, first. I guess the, the, the rule doesn't say you ha that the advisor has to put the agent's interest first, um, but it does suggest um, um, that the advisor cannot put his, the advisor or broker cannot put his interest ahead of the, the client. So, so finally, um, uh, I, I should note that perhaps part of the reason I was invited to participate um, is that I was, I was among the signatories um, of a letter from former SEC chief economist, um, which um, I questioned the, the, the thoroughness of the economic analysis in the, at the, and I should make clear, that our letter was written at the stage of the proposal, it was not written at the stage of the adoption, so I'm not going to take any view uh, about that. Uh, so a lot of people have been interested uh, in, in so why, did we, why did we opine uh, on this, but maybe that's an issue um, perhaps that I should sort of leave for the, for the, for the, for the, for the, for the. Thank you, Chester. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, that, that was an uh, excellent discussion. Took a few compliance folks. If you want to know what it's like to uh, participate in a class with one of these guys, uh, now you know. I start with principal agent theory and we work from there. Um, so uh, I'm going to try to tease out some of the things that were discussed on the panel or on your, your remarks and the rest of the panel. And if anybody has a question, I'll just prep you to flag down some people that have mics back there. You can prepare yourself to ask them. But SP, I wanted to start with you and um, uh, you know, point out from the last panel, uh, there was some talk about how lawsuits actually go to the SEC uh, based on the economic analysis. And I'm definitely not going to ask you about that because you can't speak to it. But I was hoping you could provide uh, some context to the audience on what economists actually do at the SEC. How big is your group uh, and, and what is their role or level of involvement when the commission is deliberating on an action and particularly, you know, trying to identify what a market failure is? <clears throat> Great question and thank you for sparing me from saying that I can't comment on something, you know. Uh, <clears throat> the SEC, I <clears throat> We have about, uh, my division, the Division of Economic and Risk Analysis, has about a staff of 150. And about half of those are PhD economists. So this is a large group of very talented group. Uh, they, they're also very passionate about uh, furthering the mission of the commission. And they, we get involved in rulemaking at an early stage. So the way it operates is that the rulemaking divisions, which might be investment management or corporate finance or trading and market, so the rulemaking divisions, and they are constantly in touch with the industry folks, and that combination uh, leads to they thinking that, well, something is broken, there is some problem, there is an issue. Either there is too much regulation or too little regulation, and we need to make some changes in the regulatory landscape. So they come up with a new rule, a proposal, and at an early stage, we sit down, economists sit down with them, and we try to understand what is the economic motivation. What is it that, what market failure, that, that is the term that gets used most often, what market fa failure are we trying to fix? And that discussion generally leads to a shared and better understanding of what are some of the conflicts that we are trying to resolve. And does the rule in the preliminary assessment of the economist, does the rule really get to the heart of the issue? And that give and take, that discussion 
oftentimes leads to some modification in the proposal. So this is all internal. And then a revised set of, we call it term sheet, is provided as to what is the new rule that is being proposed. And then the economists perform a detailed cost benefit analysis. Now, the desire is to quantify as much of the cost and benefit as possible. But reality is not always that is feasible. It's not for lack of desire or interest, but it is simply because many of the rules affect several dimensions of a problem. And it's difficult to identify what, how several of those dimensions would be affected and what is the dollar amount of cost or benefit in, in, in the event the rule is adopted. Plus, do remember that the benefits will accrue only when the rule is proposed, so we, have, we are in a hypothetical world. So for all of these reasons, directionally we try to identify what the costs and benefits are, and wherever possible we try to quantify the costs and benefits and lay those out in the economic analysis. Uh, <clears throat> so the, in general, the guiding principle uh, <clears throat> for the economists and for the commission is to be mindful that we, what are the objectives of the commission? And they are threefold, right? Investor protection, fair and efficient functioning of markets, and capital formation. So whenever we are thinking about it, we are mindful that the regulation on one hand has to be beneficial to investors in the, uh, by protecting investor interests, but it should not be so burdensome that it affects businesses in an adverse fashion either. So we are trying to bring to the attention what are the costs and benefits of uh, regulation and then the commission votes, but, but of course in between there is the comment period and input from outsiders is received before uh, adopting release is made. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm slightly long-winded, but I thought I would give you a perspective yeah, thanks of for what that. we do. And, and actually, let me, let me turn it to you, Chester, and ask it to you in a slightly different way, uh, in particular given the fact that you highlighted in your last slide that uh, you led a team of former chief economists to uh, comment on the rule. So as members of the public, a distinct member of the members of the public that previously served as chief economist, uh, thought to write in and say that perhaps the rule wasn't addressing the market failures, or at least in the way you were happy with, and so I'm wondering if you could elaborate and then maybe add some comments on whether or not you think uh, your concerns were addressed, or if not, what they were. Well, well you know, let, let, me, let, me, let, me try, let me first try to, to focus a bit upon how the letter came about, because I think there's been, a, there's been actually a surprising amount of public interest in that. Why did we, why did we write a letter um, about this? So I, I first I first should, should point out that um, per, personally, um, in in a variety of other contexts, I've written individual or quasi-individual comment letters in the last few years. Um, although all my other comment letters are below are, are sort of below the radar, I've written about access. I've written about the access fee pilot, very supportive, by the way, of the commission on that. Um, I've written about market, da market, market data, data and the meaning of the Exchange Act, and actually very supportive of the direction that the Commission is going in that space. I've written about proxy advisory uh, firms, uh, filed my comment letter on that at, at, the, at the start of last week and, uh, during the comment period, and have been very supportive again of the action of the, of the Commission. Um, I've, I've written a FINRA comment letter with two co-authors about transparency in the fixed income uh, market, and uh, I think supportive of, of, I think, the direction um, the Commission and FINRA are likely to, to, in the end, go in that space. So I personally have written a number of, 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 of comment letters in various spaces. But I, I think, the, 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 I think the, 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 the broader question um, obviously, and uh, that Scott is, Scott is articulating, is so why did we collectively write a comment letter about this? And so, uh, um, so I, I should uh, first I should point out that other former uh, leaders of the commission um, have at times reflected a collective voice um, um, uh, with respect to 
various issues, including some former chairmen, some former general counsels. At one point, uh, a group of them actually asked me to join uh, a comment letter that they wrote a number of years ago, and I, and I did. Um, so other, others have exercised some degree of collective voice. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, I had, a, I had the opportunity to have a two-year visit at, at MIT, actually down the hall uh, on the sixth floor at the Sloan School from, S, from SP. Um, and as a byproduct of that, I had the opportunity to organize a meeting of a former uh, SEC, SEC chief economist. So we met. We actually met probably 150 feet from SP's office. Uh, I didn't uh, we, didn't know, we didn't invite SP because we didn't know that he was going to become one of us uh, <laughs> because it was a couple of months before. Um, um, and you know, as, and as we, you know, as we talked about um, some of the things from our common experiences in, in different eras, I think we also thought that a good output from the meeting would be to take on a kind of a tangible issue. And the tangible issue that we wound up, we talked about another issue as well at the meeting. Um, but I think that issue was sort of too, too mature to really write about at that point. But we did decide to write about um, this, this, this issue. Um, uh, you know, and I think our letter reflected some, a fair amount of degree of, of co collective um, um, uh, dis dissatisfaction with the extent of the, of the economic analysis. And I, and I should say, you know, that economists at the commission are, of course, in a, in a, tough, in a tough position um, um, because they, of course, report to the commission. Um, and I think we thought it would be helpful to provide an outside uh, perspective about econ economic analysis. So that's basically, um, uh, and in this particular context. So that's how our letter came about. I don't think, I don't think any of us anticipated the firestorm uh, that, would, that, would, that would result. You know, as to uh, the, the extent to which um, the, you know, the final, the, the, the final, so we, we were commenting, of course, on the proposal. Um, uh, to what extent does the, uh, obviously the, you know, the final rulemaking itself is in the spirit uh, of, the, of the proposal, but, you know, I certainly, I, I certainly, A, can't speak to, for our group um, about the economic analysis in the final proposal, and you know, I think it's I, I, also I haven't I haven't had the need to, to systematically study it uh, such that I should render a personal opinion about that. Okay. Uh, well, thanks. And I'm going to go back to uh, the first panel of the day and something that uh, Jim kind of uh, teased out of that audience, which is about uh, uh, this idea of preserving choice. Clearly, that's something that Chairman Clayton uh, made a priority. And one question I have for the two of you is, you know, from an economic perspective, if you take the, the BD standard and move it closer to fiduciary without making it fiduciary, uh, how, how does that impact choice? Does it get all blurred? Are there anything to consider from uh, moving these two standards closer together without making it the same? Yeah, so I, I think my, yeah. So do, do, I, do I think there's something to be gained by pre preserving choice? Yeah, I'm, I'm, an, I'm an economist. Uh, and I, you know, and I believe, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a world where in, in skill, skill, investor uh, uh, skills are, are heterogeneous, investor needs are, are heterogeneous, having a variety of models uh, is, poten is, pot is potentially desirable. And I, and I certainly fully recognize um, that if, if we have, you know, if we have a very prescriptive, if we have very prescriptive regime, obviously, you know that's going to create that's going to create an that's going to create an environment where we're going to tend to merge. We, you know, I, I tend to think that that will tend to merge um, the, the the models together. You know, the art the art form here is to how to how to how to craft a, you know how to craft a set of rules um, that protect that you know that protect investor protect investors and provide a diversity um, of, of 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 tools of of cost structures. Of, of advice um, that that protect that pro that protect in investors. I mean, I think one, you know, I think one frustration that I have in this whole space is that the the role of you know, I, and I don't have an obvious solution. This is something I struggled with when I was at the commission. The role of investor, the role of investor education, and I don't mean from the point of view of a particular office at the SEC, but the broad role of investor education. I think perhaps has been under under 
underemphasized by the Commission in, 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 this, in this space. <clears throat> I, I will echo what was said earlier and, and also what <clears throat> Esther just said. Uh, seems to me that providing choice is a cornerstone of you know, how we offer services or products in other spheres of activity. And that is equally true in the case of investment advice. We wanted to give customers the choice. They can decide whether they want only broker-dealer ad advice uh, recommendation or they wanted a fiduciary service from the investment advisor. And that choice is preserved. And, and to me, it is hard to see how that can harm investors. Whenever the broker dealer is making a recommendation, he or she is required under the Reg BI to offer all the four obligations that I talked about. So whenever any advice is offered by the broker dealer, that advice carries all those obligations and the investor interests are protected. And if the investor chooses to have a fiduciary relationship with the investment advisor, then for a different price, they, they are able to obtain that. So choice is preserved, and that, that was the main principle. Um, just going back to the letter, you know, it was quite interesting. I landed in at the SEC, and one of the first things the Chairman <laughs> Jay and others, did you see that letter from the previous economist? You know, what do you think of that? So, so it was. I, I think I think the letter is in the spirit of uh, nudging us to quantify the costs and benefits a little more and take a little bit, align the analysis more closely to the underlying economic theory of principal agent. I thought those were the two main points that came. And in the adopting release, uh, we, we addressed the uh, letter, the comment. And, and just to give you an idea, uh, we do receive a lot of comments. On the proxy advisory, uh, in, on that rule, we have received 20,000 comment letters, and they're still coming in. You have a special so, drawer for Chester? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, so he, he has been busy. Well, well my, 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 my comment letter was pro on that was probably distinct from the others. Some of the 20,000 might be correlated with each other. They, they are. There are, there are, there are 13,000 that are two form letters, I think, you know. So, so there are a lot of that, but still there, are, there might be several hundred or a thousand unique letters. We, we are still going through. We address most of those, all of those, in fact, and that is required. Uh, so we are going to keep busy. Yeah. Okay, so we're, we're under three minutes. I want to see if anybody has the courage to ask the first question of the conference. Um, if you do, we got a microphone. Here we go. Uh, you run a microphone up here? Right behind you. Right behind you. No, it's <clears> uh, there. It seems to me that one of the big challenges is that there's a gap between investor expectations and the obligations of the broker dealers. Um, and it also seems to me that there's a risk that um, that gap may not have been closed by regulation best interest, that you pass a regulation with this sort of, um, just the name alone, the perception from investors is that you're showing up at your broker dealer and you're getting that fiduciary standard. You know, the, the investor expectations may have shifted more than the obligations themselves. So I guess I'm curious from the panelists, do they think that gap between investor expectations and actual standards has shrunk or widened as a result of this policy change? Well, let, let, me, let me try to address that. So personally, I don't, I don't, think, it's, I don't think it's widened. I, I was rather surprised during a congressional hearing where most of the, mo most of the panelists um, um, who, who were critical, and I think, you know, with, with some good reasons of the rule, th they suggested that the gap had widened. I don't know that I see that. But at the same time, um, the whole, the whole in, in, my, in my mind, the whole issue um, about what does best interest really mean 
is a, is a fundamental issue. And you can see from, from my presentation today, for example, that I, that I have a rather different notion about what best interest means um, than, than the type of uh, services that are, that are often provided. But, you know, so I, so I, do, think the gap I do think the gap continues, but I don't, I don't think, I personally don't think it's gotten wider. But I think there, or it may have even closed, so, it may, even clo may, may even close somewhat, but I, I don't think it's been eliminated. Uh, I will <clears throat> make a general comment, I think, you know, given my ability to say anything, uh, yeah, given the litigation. But I think that we also have to ask about the price they might be willing to pay. So in terms of expectations, you know, sometimes consumers, when, when you ask, well, they might have certain expectations, but when you quote the price for that, that level of service, well, then the answer might be somewhat different. And that, it is in that spirit that choice, I, I believe, is quite helpful. That here it is, different strokes for different folks. That element is preserved. And, and that, that's, that's how I would answer it. But, but in general, it's hard for me to see how the expectation could widen, the gap could widen. It, it may or may not have narrowed, but price for the services that they ask for in those expectations that is embedded, I don't know if that aspect has been fully factored in. So I, I certainly agree with the, the broad aspects of what, of what SP stated. I just highlight one other issue with respect to price. Um, there, in other types of domains, there are some very low-cost services um, um, that are that are out there, um, um, such as some of the in, some of the in, some of the, some of the types of index fund provided. But I also, you know, I also agree with the spirit of, of SP's comments, including that price is a is an important issue in this in this context. Well, I, I think we've run out of time. Uh, but I want to thank these two for an excellent presentations and discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.